Welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we bring you the musician's story and very excited. We have already done the rehearsal for this interview and now we're on take two with drummer, educator, author, clinician, and overall good dude, Jim Toscano is with us today. Hi, Jim. How you doing? How you doing there, Dave? I got the good dude rating. Excellent. Good dude. <laughs> cool dude. Really glad you're here. I really appreciate it. Thanks uh, for having Again. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we tried this. Our tech didn't work. It was my tech. It was my fault, but we got it covered today. So you just got back from a two hour uh, session today. Let's start with that. And, and what ha- okay. What were you doing and how did it go? Yeah. So um, this is actually I'm doing pre-production for um, a great friend and artist that I work for, Roger Street Friedman. And um, I've been working in his band for He said today seven years, so it's quite possible that it's been seven years. Um, But he's a great songwriter. He, uh, this we're working on our third album right now, and um, he's been doing a lot of writing, going down to Nashville, collaborating with different writers. uh, And it looks like this third album that we're working on, he's got Larry Campbell signed up to produce, and so we always have great guest artists. Um, And he's sort of in the singer songwriter vein. but with a kind of deep rooted in uh, roots Americana rock, and uh, it's definitely good fun. That's very yeah, cool. So and that's what I'm working on today. And you're playing drums on the tracks. Playing drums on the tracks, and um, this sort of the pre-production is basically he has about he wrote about 40 tunes for this upcoming record that we can choose from. 40 songs that basically he wrote on acoustic guitar with his vocal, and then we sort of hash out the arrangements. Ahead of time, we do a few rehearsals, and then we'll go in the studio and record the album, probably in, I would say, summer, uh, by the time the summer comes. But we do have a spring tour coming up, so we're getting some of the uh, tunes ready for touring. So That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. So let me let me invite the audience who is watching, whether live or in the replay, let us know where you're watching from in the world. And if you have any questions for Jim, put them in the comments and we will try to get to them. We are in the Motor Studios in Portland, Maine. Jim, you're in your studio in New York, correct? Yep, Staten yeah. Island, New York. Love it. Very cool. And yes, indeed. that's mind-blowing. How does somebody write 40 songs? What is that? This oh, guy- my God. Well, so I'm, I, and, and you'll have to forgive me for forgetting what year our second album came out, but I think it was, a, it was two years ago now. So we did the album Shoot the Moon, um, which is on iTunes and it's everywhere, uh, or look up rogerstreetfriedman.com, check out his website. But, uh, it's been a couple of years. So he's been writing furiously since the last album. And yeah, that's a lot of songs. And Roger is very prolific when it comes to writing. He's a great songwriter. He he really writes from the heart, and um, and it's fun stuff to to play on. You know, you really playing for the song kind of tunes. Yeah. And so, yeah. How, how does that work for you, Jim? You go in and you hear a demo, and then you start to lay down what you think would serve the song, or does he yeah, have an yeah. idea that he asks you about? Well, most of it is, uh, so he does a a workspace um, list of recordings. So basically they could be acoustic guitar and vocal demos. They could be fully produced things that he's done in the studio with like Apple loops and, you know, where where there's more of a a solid idea of what he wants. But in general, he gives me pretty full range of decision making on the drums and then he'll make his suggestions as we go along. So today we worked on four tunes. Um, none of them really had drums on them from the demos. So basically, I wish I had the charts with me. Um, last night I drafted the four tunes, did a quick roadmap chart, jotted down a couple little things that I thought might work, got to the rehearsal, played through each one of the songs with myself, Roger, Frank Ferrara on guitar, Matthew Schneider on bass, upright bass, guitar, uh, acoustic, and drums, and um, we kind of start to put it together. So, you know, my my method will will always be start out with the most basic sparse groove, just lay something down that's functional, 
um, and go through it, get a feel for where it's going, and then start kind of crafting the parts. And my involvement with the arrangements and stuff kind of comes into carving out space in the tunes or bringing out certain parts. So I will always make those suggestions and songwriters seem really appreciative. Roger is very appreciative of those little moments that I try to create in the music. Um, and so it's more, it's not about the drum parts. It's really about bringing the song to life right. and what I should play or should not play to make that happen. Yeah. So. so, so that is an art form, I think in and of itself, right? Learning to serve the song, serve the music, Tell us, yeah, I, uh, tell, tell us about some of the lessons you've learned about doing that. Well, I mean, this this could go back to um, like one of my first uh, recording experiences. And I think I was about 17. I had already done a bunch of stuff in the studio with with bands and friends. But the first real pro studio situation, um, I was working with this band um, uh, called Atomic Passion. Uh, if you remember, that was an actual, wasn't that like a Honeymooners episode or something? Um, and so we, uh, you know, we went into the studio. It was a female-fronted pop band, uh, four-piece band. And we had a producer. His name is Leo Adamian. I don't know if you, you know the song, um, If You Like P Pina Coladas. Yeah, yeah, sure. He Rupert. played drums on that. Is that right? Um, so he was, he was kind of hev heavily engrossed in the New York music scene. And um, we went in to do this record. And he hired Will Lee, Kaz Silver, Ula Hedwig, uh, Fat Boys, which was a rap duo at the time, uh, John Putnam on guitar, like all these heavyweight musicians. And I'm like a kid. I show up with my giant red spark of Ludwig drum set. And um, on this first session, you know, I, I go to work sort of playing all these ideas that I had as a kid, you know, sort of probably overplaying. And, um, and Leo kind of taking me aside and saying, you know, that one fill you did that went, bop, bop, bop. he was like, I love that. He's like, that is the fill for the song. And I'm thinking like, really? Like, you don't want the, you know, all the big fireworks. So, you know, basically that was like, oh, okay. Like, in other words, you know, it's the little things that I, that I'm doing that work better. And he, he'd said to me, like, don't lose the stuff that you're doing. Don't lose all that fun stuff. Mm but it's for a different kind of gig. Yeah. And I was like, wow, okay. So it really came down to, and in that session, I had to make this thing work. We recorded all the rhythm tracks that day. And I learned, okay, I got to tone it down, really just play simple, play for the song. And I think, you know, Leo kind of, Leo Damien was like the first guy to really get that in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. So they didn't need the double Radom a cue or whatever the. You know, yeah, exactly. They just needed yeah, something yeah. simple, right? Something simple. Yep. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about because I want you got other projects that I want to check in about, but also you know where did you get your start? How did you fall in love with the drums in the first place, Jim? Okay, so um, so I think you know the first thing was uh, seeing bands like Kiss and Aerosmith and seeing um on TV because we didn't have the internet. Right. So it wasn't like, um, you know, like it is now for kids where they have this overflow of, of information. Basically I would hear from another kid like, Hey man, have you ever heard kiss? And then I was like, no, what's that? I was like, and I remember that my reaction to that was kiss. Yeah. Like it's just one word. I was like, what is that? Um, but seeing them as a 10 year old was like, Oh wow that looks like fun. Like I want to do that. Um, and then starting to kind of, you know, look at these rock bands and, and, and figure, okay, that's the instrument I want to play and started fooling around with, I had a friend down the block that had some sticks and started fooling around with stuff. And, um, it turned out that, uh, a family friend of ours at the end of my grandmother's road was the Debose and Chet Debo, who's a great drummer yeah. and author. He, he wrote, um, funk drumming workbook and all these different uh workbooks he's a long island drummer he got me interested even more in drumming and kind of put together a little band by the time i was 12 we had this little band and we played um at a nursing home and you know got all dressed up and played some billy joel tunes and you know that was sort of like my first um dive into a professional situation um as a kid um and that influence was really big but I think um, I mentioned this to you before, 
when I first got the idea of playing drums, I didn't own any drums. And I had some sticks that, like I said, a friend had given me. But on the way home from school one day, I saw a bass drum in a tree. And um, it's it's totally nutty, but I was walking home, saw this drum in a tree, climbed up and got it. I think somebody must have thrown it out of a window um, near my junior high school, and it landed in this little tree. So I got the thing, and I, I carried it home. It had one head on it. I didn't have a pedal, so it was just a bass drum that I laid over like a table. And I basically played on that table of a drum, and that was my first drum. And that kind of got me really wanting to do it. Wow. And um, banging on that and paint cans uh, as a start uh, before I actually got my first real kit. Which was what? Uh, which my first drum set was uh, this Red Sparkle Ludwig 1970s Ludwig kit. Mm. And I believe it or not, I actually had it up until a couple of years ago. So I... I had it, I lent it out for a while, gave it to a student for a while, it would come back, I would lend it out again, because the thing is tremendous. So my first drum kit was a 24, 14, 18, mm. with a, uh, I'm trying to remember, the snare was a Slingerlin Piccolo, Buddy Rich Piccolo snare with the side-by-side -side lugs, yeah. and um, but the drums were tremendous, and I was tiny. I mean, I'm still... Ver, you know, vertically compromised. But, um, you know, as a kid, so I was playing on this giant drum set. Um, I had a couple of bad cymbals uh, and then eventually got some Zildjian Hi-Hats and I got a Zildjian Ride and I played on that drum kit for a really long time mm. and actually added on to it eventually as, um, as I got into high school and started playing uh, more. I was influenced by Fusion and... I got myself a second bass drum and a couple more toms and built this big double bass kit um, and then got into playing in heavy metal bands and, you know, did all the, the Lamore scene in Brooklyn, which was like where all the big metal bands would come through and kind of, you know, uh, play the local clubs. Uh, my mom would drive me to those gigs, drop me off with my giant double bass set. Wow. Yeah. A 24 so, inch bass drum is big now, for God's sakes. Never mind yeah, when you're a kid. Right? Carrying two of them around. <laughs> And I bring a vibraphone on stage, which was on a whole nother story. A vibraphone. I'd set up this. I'd set up this big red Ludwig Red Sparkle kit with a vibraphone and a set of roto toms. And the vibraphone was literally for one part of one song, but it was so weird to have it on stage that right. people like like right. that thing. That's a lot so I play this one little interlude on the vibraphone and then go back to the drum set. Yeah. So the vibraphone, like the the thing behind you there. You're talking. Yeah, about. except it was a it was a white. It was a white marine pearl um, Jenko vibraphone that I got from my gym teacher in high school. Amazing. And um, he was a drummer and was downsizing his gear and sold me this, this vibraphone. So I started studying mallets um, okay. in the like early in high school and then into college. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you had some education. And who who were the drummers, Jim? I mean, you mentioned Kiss and Aerosmith. So we got Peter, Chris, and Joey Kramer. Who were yeah, that was the very start. That yeah. was the seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Who were your uh, other in major influences with drumming? So um, everything's kind of started to change when – so first I went from, okay, the rock and roll guys into discovering um, progressive rock guys. So listening to Yes – and Genesis and Rush. I was definitely more fascinated with Yes um, and Bill Bruford. Yeah. And then checking out Bruford kind of led me to, you know, looking up who else was playing on these with these musicians. And, you know, like like I said, I mean, now kids will just look on the Internet and find out who everybody played with. Right. I would have to go to the record store on, on Avenue U in Brooklyn. We had this place, Titus Oaks. So I'd go into Titus Oaks and flip through the album covers yeah. looking for different guys. So I found a Bruford record, turned that over. Oh, he played with Jeff Berlin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jeff Berlin's records, look for that. Then I discovered Alan Holdsworth. Oh, wow. Oh, wait, he played with this guy. He played with, you know, this drummer. And, you know, you kind of would find your way that way, looking at the back of the records, looking up the personnel and starting to find them. And then discovering Frank Zappa and find, you know, discovering Mahavishnu Orchestra and going into sort of all the fusion, um, different subgenres of fusion and yeah. discovering um, Return to Forever and finding out Lenny White's a lefty because we didn't mention that I'm a Southpaw. You are a Southpaw. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so I sort of went heavy in the fusion yeah. um, realm, lis- really listening to fusion for for a while in my early teens, especially um, uh, before I started playing sort of, you know, the heading towards the pop thing again yeah. um, for like work, you know, right, right. deciding to work for, as a, you know, for a living as a drummer. Um, so, so what was that dream that was developing, Jim, that, you know, how did that come about and what was that first gig that you went, I might be able to do this for and, and yeah. pay the bills? Right. I think, um, you know, early on, there were, there were two paths. So in my mind, I was like, I want to be a rock star like everybody else. You know, I want to do the big arena tours and, you know, I wanted to kind of go in that direction. But I mean, I wasn't really listening to music that would have headed me in that direction. I was I was really listening to, you know, more fusion and kind of experimental stuff and instrumental music. And I was really into Frank Zappa. And so, you know, I didn't really set my myself up to follow that dream um, and didn't really consider it. You know, I kind of just went along playing, trying to only play original music for a really long time. Um, and it was sort of during high school that. I wound up working for like regional theater and um, working for these little theater companies. And I got heavy into the idea of doing theater. And then the, I, the dream of like, oh, rock star started to become, you know, maybe I could work doing shows and then, you know, working with um, a couple of songwriters, even as a young kid, starting to go like, oh, I could just do sessions and play drums for songwriters. And I really enjoyed you know, those two avenues. And I started to, to really look at, okay, it's more practical. You know, I could work, um, doing the show scene. And I, I kind of was priming myself to head towards the Broadway thing. Um, so one of the jobs that really set me in that direction was I got a, I got a gig working for a little show called Rasputin. That was an off Broadway show at the Samuel Beckett theater. I was playing electronic percussion and, you know, sort of, um, I had like a Simmons setup with an Octopad and then I had like Rototom rims and like all this weird stuff. Yeah. And I wrote the the drum score because I was working for these musical directors that would basically say like, hey, we, we wrote a musical, but we need a drum book. And so I'd start to write the drum book for it. And then that gig kind of got me in the mindset of like, oh, I would love to do Broadway because then, you know, I had the theater experience and it just seemed like something natural for me. I was a really strong reader. Um, and then, um, that kind of changed as I got older, I kind of found out like, oh, wait a minute. Um, well, I'll tell you a quick example. So I was studying with Ray Marchica, um, who's a Broadway first call Broadway guy and took some lessons with him. And he actually suggested that I go to drummers collective and study. But while I was studying with him, I went down to read, um, to learn the book for Will Rogers Follies. Right. And I I wasn't really going to get the gig or wind up um, subbing it, I don't think. But he he just allowed me to sit there and watch and observe and kind of see what was going on in the Broadway scene. And I was like, so like if I did sub on this, so how would I switch things around? Because I'm a lefty. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that doesn't know. Yeah, you're not switching things around. And I realized like, wow, for a lefty, unless I get my own show. Yeah subbing i better learn to play righty first of all or i'm not doing this right so you know the idea of being a broadway sub kind of became like oh man i I don't think i can actually just step in and you know um my buddy joe bergamini who you know you know when he subbed for tommy i go tommy had a sign up on the drum set he said that said what you can adjust uh it might have been i don't remember exactly snare height yeah and seat right what you can't adjust everything else right. you know so like yeah. you know being and and this is a funny topic with the lefty thing because um tom famularo who's you know one of my yeah. greatest teachers ever yeah. he um he's got me working on an article mm-hmm. where it's going to be myself daniel glass rod morgenstein we're finding like all the southpaws mm. um to kind of talk about yeah and, you know, write an article about what yes. it's like being a lefty drummer. Right, right. Um, well, as it is, it has its own set of challenges. Sure, you know? and Ringo is in that camp as well, because Ringo is a lefty, but his grandmother or aunt made him play righty, and I don't know how he does that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a it's a funny thing. Like, for students, you know, when I'm when I'm demonstrating, I, I will get on the righty kit and play a little bit. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, you can play open on a righty kit, so you're actually playing lefty. Right. But it's the foot, yeah. you know, getting the feet together. So having that same level of coordination yes. that you have as a lefty with your feet right. on, you know, and and it's funny. And t- I teach so many people right now, and it's I keep discovering people that like the open thing, but they're so they'll get on the righty kit, they'll play lefty, but they want their feet to be righty. Mm-hmm. So there's certain people find, you know. There's a lot of different variables right, right. involved. There's no one uh, way to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And then I have a couple of people that, like if I have a lefty, they get on my kit. And I have a couple of students that play righty on my kit, but they like the left foot lead wow. on the bass drum. So I don't know. I mean, it, Amazing. No, it's yeah. so you, yeah, you're not only doing sessions, record, you know, in the studio recording, you're playing live with some bands that I want to talk about, uh, but you're teaching students as well. How can, yeah. how can folks connect with you if they want to take lessons from you, Jim? Um, if you, well, if you just do a quick Google search and look up my name, um, my studio will come up. Okay. Um, my old website will come up, which it should be more active than it is. However, I did update the calendar recently, so a lot of my dates are up on the calendar. But um, as far as students finding me, yeah, Jim Toscano, um, mm-hmm. I use a platform called Music Teacher Helper, which is um, it's sort of an, an online um, office assistant sort of okay. type of program where I schedule everything through this app. Um, the students can download it on their, on their smartphones or on a tablet. And um, they can self-book on my calendar. Um, So if you look up Jim Toscano, probably in that search, it'll say Jim Toscano at musicteacherhelper.com. And um, that is a way to get in touch with me for lessons for sure. Excellent. Uh, Or through my website. They can use the contact form. Right. And we've got that on the screen right now, the jimtoscano.com. Right. Yep. Folks, go to that and check it out. Now, the other you got a couple of other projects. You have a book, filling in the grooves, and then a couple of other bands. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Yeah, so this this book, this is still the mock up. Okay. Um, and right now the book is, I believe, from my last email over the weekend, it's about to go to print. So um, it's been a very long work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so I, I, the concept came up in about 2010 to write a fill book. And basically the reason I started doing that is I was compiling drum fills for students, constantly getting students saying like, oh, man, I don't know what to play for this type of fill or that type of fill or, you know, asking me, you know, um, basically to come up with ideas for a song that they're doing with their band. They weren't sure what to play for, for a certain type of genre. So I started collecting these fill ideas. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I sort of had fun with the the idea of motifs, you know, coming up with like goofy names and sort of, you know, you you know, we call uh, we have the bucket of fish fill, you know, right. so we, we, we start naming all these things. Yeah. I actually have a, a page in here called bucket of fish. Nice. Um, but so I started to collect these fills and basically came up with um, a pretty long list. And then I I thought, well, this would make a great book because. There's so many great books on the market for groove stuff, yeah. but not a lot of fill books. True. There are definitely some older classic fill books, mm-hmm. but nothing really new that kind of was a uh, was sort of cultivating ideas and and just a, a library, yeah. you know. So I put together this library of drum fills, and um, I shopped it. Uh, originally, I shopped it. Um, to Dom Famularo a long time ago, and he told me to speak to Joe Bergamini, who's a good friend of mine, and they have a label uh, called Wisdom yes. uh, Media, yeah. and they've put out uh, quite a few drum books now, yeah. and they said that they didn't have anything like this in their ca- in their catalog, and um, so Joe seemed really interested, so I started making it more formal. Um, I work on Sibelius, the platform Sibelius, yes. so I started doing the engraving myself. Um, and so through this project, I've kind of built this thing over the last several years. Yeah. Um, and I shot a video for it, about 300 videos. Oh. There's about 500 audio tracks, uh, which are mostly demonstration. And then there's 10 play alongs. And um, it's really a, a fun project, multimedia kind of project. So That's fantastic. So um, there'll be the written part and a digital part as well. Yeah. So this is the first one that Wisdom is doing in the in the digital format. So 
the book will actually be and, and the dis- the distributor is Alfred. So um uh Dave Black finished um redlining it, you know, not that long ago and we got the final um okay on it. Now it's going to print. But so Alfred will have it up and they have um a platform that they use called Purple Player. Yes. Um so the media is going to be up on the Purple Player platform which I'm really excited about and yeah. blown away that you know, it'll be up there with some of these great drum books that I'm influenced by. Right. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, it's, that's a very cool platform. I've got a bunch of stuff on there, too. So uh, uh, the the other project you've got going on is Kiros. Tell us about yeah, that. So, um, so that's the working title for the band at the moment, which which um, it's I think that's going to wind up being the official name. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the moment. That's what I pitched to the guys. And basically, this project is its kind of interesting. Um, uh, one of my childhood friends and bass players that I've worked with on and off for decades and decades, um, we, we've we worked in many bands when we were kids. I had a fusion band. He was my bass player in the fusion band back in like the, I guess, the late 80s, early 90s. We had a, a band called Point of View. We were sort of playing like, the 55 bar scene and Visionis and like all those downtown clubs. Um, and so he and I have played on and off for years. And then we both kind of went in the songwriter playing model where we both worked for songwriters a lot and occasionally would get called to work together for different songwriters. And so it had been a really long time since we played together. And one day he called me up and he said, Hey man, I've been writing a bunch of like instrumental funky fusion kind of things with um vibraphonist bill Ware, and um bill's played with like steely dan and um elvis costello he's currently working with deborah harry he's just a great instrumentalist an amazing vibes player really warm and great human being um and so i was like yeah count me in because i've always wanted to do sort of a bass and and mallet uh thing with drums and a Mutual friend of ours, Russ Palladino, tenor sax player, um, agreed to play sax. So we started writing these tunes together. Uh, so it's a four-piece thing right now. We write and record remotely. So um, Rob Glick will send me a bass line, nice. and he'll put it up in Dropbox. I load it into my studio. I'll lay down some drums, send it back. He'll tweak his bass part. We send it over to Bill. Bill lays down some chords. Uh, then it goes over to Russ. Russ lays down a melody. Then it goes back around until we refine it and get it right. Um, we got about eight tunes uh, happening now. Okay. There's a couple. I posted a couple Instagram things of me just laying down drums for those guys. Um, one is just drums, and one has the bass and vibes on it. But it's the stuff just has a really interesting vibe to it. It's sort of songwriting in a pop format in a way. It's sort of a and B, you know, bridge, A, B, you know, right. kind of sections, but it's instrumental and it's real funky and got some fun, uh, rhythmic things that are happening between us. So that band is, um, is a new project this year. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that, um, in 2019, we'll have a record done and go out and do some playing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now this and Kiros is different than, um, giant flying turtles. How many bands do you, are you in right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, well, I do a lot of freelancing, but my main projects right now would be giant flying turtles, Roger street, Friedman and Kiros. Um, so giant flying turtles is, um, it was a trio a few years ago where it was upright bass, piano, and drums. And we were doing this sort of quirky Americana um, stuff, uh, two vocalists. The, so Johnny Young on keys, and he's a um, very talented keyboard player, singer, songwriter. Um, won an Emmy for like writing music for like the Dr. Phil show and like all these, you know, he sort of did TV work. And, um, but he's a really talented guy. Um, on a side note, he's, um, doesn't have sight. So he's a blind piano player and, uh, really incredible. I mean, he's talented anyway, but when you see him working his rig yeah. and knowing what patches to push while, mm. while not being able to see anything right. is incredible. Wow. And, um, Calvin Bennett on upright bass. And so it was a trio and we sort of play this, a lot of, uh, swingy kind of stuff and, you know, but with all this sort of progressive influence. So people were going like, what are you guys like progressive bluegrass or something? You know, we got all these really funny kind of um, people trying to figure out what our genre was. Right, right. Um, 
And uh, so we've done two albums so far. We're working on our third record. And coincidentally, we're recording that record at Roger's studio, Roger Friedman's studio. So uh, there's a little incestuous music uh, play going on here, but it's it's really um, a great community of guys. And now Giant Flying Turtles, we kind of were really... Johnny was switching from guitar to keys all the time. And we were like, man, we should get a guitar player. So we started having guys sit in. And uh, TJ Jordan, who's this really talented guitar player, um, that actually did a like, couple corporate dates with, you know, playing society stuff, um, came into the mix. And, and um, he sat in with us on a gig, and it just felt right. So we've added him to the mix. So now we sort of have this heavier sound, electric guitar nice. mixed in with we still have the upright bass, we still have the keys, but now we have an electric guitarist. And and that music is really quirky and long sort of arrangements, a lot of instrumental sections and everything. So it's got a progressive thing, but it's got all this sort of roots. Um, really fun band. Yeah. We're having a great time. And yeah. It doesn't matter what genre it is. It's just music that you like and music you guys enjoy making, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's really that's a that's a fun project too. Yeah. And and how do you keep all of that in balance? And I know I got to watch our time because I know you've got a, a student coming up as, as yeah. well, right? Six minutes away. Six minutes away. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so last question then: How do you balance all of this, Jim? Um. So I think. You know, the, the one thing is, and, and especially with my teaching schedule is pretty uh, intense. I also do workshops and um, I have a clinic, a clinic schedule that I try to keep. Um, but I think, you know, balance comes from um, just being disciplined and, and getting up every day and sort of making a list of all the different things that I have to do. Like last night I was writing charts for Rogers thing. Um, today I have, and, and today I have that rehearsal and your thing. And then right after this, I go into a lesson right after that, I'm going to fire up logic and bring up some tracks for Kairos and then start working on that tonight. So I think it's just really, um, staying super organized, uh, with my projects. And basically, you know, uh, something I've learned recently is saying yes to somebody else is saying no to yourself. And so you can't say yes to everything that that people want you to do so i try to keep it to the things that i feel like are really uh moving me forward as a as an artist and as as a player um so you know you keep those those few things that that are really making the difference in your life um i think that's how i'm doing it yeah and i i know also you're given clinics and you're part of the sabian education network too man yeah drum teacher right sabian education uh sen right um uh, sabianed.com and Joe Bergamini, my, my friend Joe is the gatekeeper of that whole thing. So hit him up and it's a great platform. Yeah. Uh, definitely check it out. It's really great. Jim, thank you so much for your time and, and all of your music. We're going to post this uh, everywhere and, and, uh, I hope you get some lunch in today as well. That's important, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm going to try, try to eat at some point. That's right. Exactly. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, um, our pleasure. Jim, Jim Toscano is on Musicians on the Record today. Thanks for watching. I'm David Ward. Thank you, everybody.